Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. One of the doctors we work with deemed the wallet biopsy, and that is, you know, well-meaning physicians trying to insulate their patients from further harm by not really getting into the nitty gritty of this or making space for this discussion because they know their patient can't afford it. It's Cancer Awareness Month. And I can't even imagine hearing the words, you have cancer. And unfortunately, with that diagnosis comes many decisions. And one of those may need to be around your fertility preservation. So you may wonder, what is that? Why in the world do I need to do that? And how in the world do I begin? So I interview Joyce Reinecke, who is the executive director for the Alliance for Fertility Preservation and she answers all of these questions and more. And by the way, she had firsthand experience with her own fertility preservation journey when she was diagnosed with cancer 20 years ago. So she truly understands where you are, and this is such a sensitive topic. I wanted to make sure to pick the right person to help you understand what you or your loved one needs to do. And we do talk about adolescence as well. So please do share this information with anyone you think this may be relevant for, because it is a very important topic. First of all, I want to thank you for having me and thank you for covering this topic. I know it's, you know, a subset of, of kind of infertility and it's, we live in, in as a subset of cancer. So I appreciate, um, you know, the attention for this issue. Um, Yeah, the Alliance for Fertility Preservation is a national nonprofit organization, um, and it was incorporated as a nonprofit in 2013. It was founded actually by two uh, reproductive specialists at Cornell and a a doctor on the oncology side at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so because those institutions are, you know, across the street from one another, they worked closely together and a lot of patients would be referred if they had cancer and they were at Sloan Kettering. Um, Sloan Kettering didn't have their own 
and don't have their own reproductive endocrinologists, um, you know, to provide fertility services. So there was a lot of partnership there. And from, you know, just their own um, discussions there, they identified that there was a need to try to bring oncologists and oncology providers and reproductive specialists and experts together, you know, to keep trying to streamline these services and make them easier um, for cancer patients. And so they really reached out to experts across the country and wanted to have, you know, a national presence and really move the needle on change across systems, right? How patients were being informed and what kind of information they were getting and making sure, honestly, that the oncologists had up-to-date information. There were a lot of misconceptions still about, you know, fertility treatment and how it worked and how long it would take and whether it was something that was appropriate, you know, for their patients. Um, And so that was the origin of the organization. I signed on as the executive director in uh, the middle of 2014. Um, and that was after some of the board members had notified me that there was an opening. The original executive director had had left. And I knew a lot of these experts in this space through previous work that I had done at an organization called Fertile Hope, which I think was really the first organization to really, you know, look at this issue from the nonprofit side of things and for patients. And then from that role, I went on and um, became part of Live Strong. They had been a, a funder of Fertile Hope and really, you know, knew a lot about the young adult cancer space. And so the founder of Fertile Hope, Lindsay Norbeck, who was my boss and mentor, um, she and I stayed on when Fertile Hope became a part of Live Strong, and we were fertility advisors there for many years. And so through that work, you know, going to ASRM and ASCO and all the conferences and, you know, working with clinics across the country, I knew a lot of the experts who formed the board of the Alliance. Why don't we first start with the issue at hand. I would assume that when someone gets a cancer diagnosis, the number one thing that they're thinking about is, again, I'm going to guess like, I don't want to die. I'm scared to lose my hair. Like there's all these things. I think probably lowest on the list, unless someone's in the know is their fertility. I mean, I could be wrong. What are the facts? What should people be aware of You're absolutely right in that when people are first diagnosed with cancer, especially, you know, for a young adult, you know, who are really the people who are going to care about fertility, but for young adults being diagnosed with cancer, you know, it's it's usually quite shocking and unexpected and nothing, you know, in the normal course of life. And so people often will have symptoms, you know, for, for long periods of time and just discounted or they're otherwise healthy. So they compensate and maybe they get diagnosed, you know, later than they should. So it's always, you know, it's a very out of, out of time kind of diagnosis. Cancer is really a, a disease for the most part of older age. Right. And so it's a very isolating, scary experience um, for young people. And you're absolutely right in that the focus of course, first and foremost is on survival, right? And getting people into treatment and addressing the cancer as quickly as possible. Having said that, there are a lot of studies that show in this age group, meaning young adults, those from like 15 to 39, fertility and family building and that option for parenthood, you know, post-treatment is really the second concern to mortality. So it is a really pressing concern. And, you know, this often happens when people are in the midst of that process in some way. So maybe they're, they're dating or they're just getting serious or they're thinking about marriage, something that's just coming to the fore for them. And obviously not something they want to sacrifice. You know, the other thing about this is that it's become a more, I think, important and salient issue for these patients because cancer treatment has come a long way. So most patients, if, if you are diagnosed, you know, when you are under, you know, 40, 45, the survival rates for these patients are really good. They're, they're, you know, North of 80% of patients. And of course it, 
everyone's different and, and it depends what disease, you know, you actually are diagnosed with what kind of cancer it is, how advanced it is. So obviously people are going to prioritize things differently, but for most of these patients, they have a really good shot at survival. And I think the fact that treatments have come a long way and, um, you know, we start to see and have seen over the past, probably two decades, a movement toward um, issues like survivorship generally, right? What is someone's life going to look like later? And how can we minimize the impacts that the disease and also the treatment for the disease has, you know, because a lot of treatments, um, radiation and chemotherapy, they can be very toxic, right? So they're Mm -hmm. toxic to the cancer cells, but they're, they're toxic to other cells in your body. And most of these treatments are systemic. So they're, they're hitting your entire system. You know, there is a whole body of, you know, literature and, and scholarship around what's called late effects of treatment. And as I said, there has been a move by all the major academic cancer centers for sure to really consider survival, quality of life, long-term health effects. And that is where infertility, I think, has taken hold, you know, where people see downstream, this really impacts someone's ability to move forward with their life, you know, and to get married and to have a family and do the things that they expected to do. So um, I think that that's been a change. And I think that's gotten more oncologists to address this, right? If you were to grade where we are in the knowledge scale, where do you think the cancer actually you might have two tiered grading system mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I just interviewed Dr. Kristen Rojas, whose passion is around preserving and maintaining and improving your sexual health when it comes to cancer because of cancer treatments and that what happens to your body. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked a lot about processes and it seems like there's, you know, the major cancer centers and academic centers, and then there's the smaller towns. So I don't know if we need to break it apart. One of the things I like to do on this podcast is talk about the hard truths, because I don't think it does justice for Mm -hmm. people (laughs) to just try to paint a rosy picture. I just want to preface this by saying, you know, it's not scientific. I'm not everywhere. Uh So a lot of this is anecdotal Yes, and it is hard to compare centers. There have been studies that looked at, you know, NCI cancer centers, which are really kind of top tier centers and how many of them address fertility. And I would say that the vast majority of them at least have some information you know, on their website, through their resource offerings. Um, So I do think that they've come a long way. I will say I personally was diagnosed with cancer, you know, more than 20 years ago, which is what brought me into this world. And um, this was not a topic that was addressed at all. And if you searched major national, you know, organizations or entities, you you would not find this information. And I, I wasn't finding this information. So I think there has been a change. I think one of the drivers of that change came in 2006, ASCO, which is the American Society for Clinical Oncology. They put out kind of the the first guidelines on fertility and cancer. And that was, I think, really a watershed occurrence. And so they really recognized this is an important problem. And everyone on the oncology side, right, all the oncologists need to at least be putting your patients on notice and explaining to them what options exist for them and that you should be doing this as early as you can in their in their course of treatment so that they can access interventions before they start gonadotoxic treatment or treatment that might leave them sterilized. Having said that, you know, when I was at Fertile Hope, my my boss, Lindsay Beck, who was the founder, she served on that committee that that was, you know, she was a co-author of those guidelines. And we were kind of on the inside track of that and following it. And it took years to develop. And we really thought that was going to, that would be it. It would change everything. And so I do have to say, you know, there's, there's on the one hand, having guidelines, professional guidelines, you know, for, for oncologists, that is a huge watershed moment and change, but guidelines are not really enforced They are, you know, recommendations. And so there isn't really that kind of mechanism that says you must do this, right? And I do think 
obviously in my personal experience and now professional experience with oncology groups and those especially dedicated to pediatric patients and young adults. I mean, they really are out there trying to do the right thing and they want to do the right thing. And so I do think at especially the academic centers, you know, this is, you know, something that is considered and usually brought forward and discussed. The the truth of the matter is, though, most cancer patients are treated in their own community, right? So in local centers, and I think that's where you do still have a lot of variability, you know, and you do encounter doctors who have their standard protocols and their standard ways of doing things. And there are definitely ideas about or concerns about upsetting a patient Um, about offering or holding out some kind of service that A, you think they can't afford. So you're going to cause further harm in that way and distress. And we've absolutely heard that from doctors who want to do the right thing and are trying to kind of safeguard their patients. And there's still, I would say B, is that pervasive notion of head down, let's get through it, let's let's get to treatment, and we'll deal with everything else later. And so I think in this instance, it's really hard to do that because often if, if you have this exposure, then you can't fix it later. That's where I think this particular side effect, if you will, or late effect can't, can't be addressed afterwards. Right. Right. Um, so I think that's an important message that we're still trying, you know, to get, to get across and to be fair, I'm sure, as I said, there's variability with what community specialists are doing and how much they know. Um, I think the information is available. And I will say that periodically in talking to patients, I still hear about patients who, do go to major academic centers and are, and are told of this possible side effect, but then also counseled in such a way, you know, we'll, we'll worry about it afterwards. So, you know, that is always surprising to me when I hear, okay. when I hear that. So from really world-class specialists in their cancer, I still know of patients who come through and they And they say, well, the doctor said that this is something that we could do after I get through this first round of chemo or whatever, you know? And so sometimes it takes a tenacious patient. So it's a balance too. And, you know, what, what we used to encounter, honestly, like back in the fertile hope days was oncologists who would actually say, we used to listen in on um, focus groups and things, right? And here doctors say, my patients are not raising this, you know? And so there was a misunderstanding as to how much knowledge people really have. And it's hard when you're in the space, when you're the specialist and you know how chemotherapy works, but patient, because a patient doesn't raise it, it doesn't mean that they don't care about it. It just might mean they don't know. So this again is why we as patients need to be our own advocate. It's interesting too, because um, when I did my episode on orgasm, one of the things was doctors are afraid and uncomfortable and don't know how to talk about sexual health. And so I could totally see the same parallel in cancer because it's hard. Like on the one hand, you don't know what kind of patient you have. They're not trained to be therapists to calm the patient down So like after the fact, the patient may say, why didn't you bring it up? But if they brought it up before the fact, the patient may lose their mind on them because they're like, but I don't want to die. And so it's, it's so complex and there are no easy answers. And I feel like almost changing the title of this podcast uh, to don't blame the doctors and the pharmaceutical companies. We're all responsible because it's healthcare is, is, is really really complex. So thank you for sharing those facts. And I think it's important for people to have that reality check on the lay of the land. And again, there's no one to blame. Let's start with understanding who needs to be concerned and how they need to think about fertility preservation. But are there like certain types of cancer treatments that we know don't like, do you have a registry of, okay, if you're have this type of cancer or this type of treatment, don't worry. If you have this one, you must worry this Mm -hmm. one. We're not sure. So if someone's doing like a 
there's choices people have to make risk all the time. Risk benefit. Yeah. Right. yeah. Risk, yeah. risk benefit. Mm-hmm. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you talk about like who needs to, to think about this and how they, they need to think about it? You know, this issue sucked me in and has taken over my life. Um, but I would say everyone needs to worry about it. So I think that is really okay. still something that's misunderstood. So if you are diagnosed when you're still in your reproductive years, and by that, I, I mean, even before maybe you've entered puberty. So if you are a parent of a child who has cancer, this could affect them, you know, as well. So I would say almost any cancer patient could be at risk for infertility. Um, And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, the biggest risk is going to come from chemotherapy and particular chemotherapeutics have um, higher levels of toxicity, you know, to the reproductive system than others. So there's that nuance that we can discuss, but as I said, it's systematic, right? So you are administered chemotherapy it's going out throughout your body. And so you really can't prevent that from also affecting your reproductive system, particularly your ovaries or your, uh, sperm producing cells. The other part of it, I would say is that in the world of cancer treatment, you know, having a treatment plan is often a moving target. So there are many instances in which someone may be diagnosed and they may have a a set, you know, plan for their treatment that actually is, is quite low risk. And maybe they're going to start out and have some kind of localized surgery or localized radiation. Um, and it doesn't look like they're high risk or the, the chemotherapy that they're supposed to have is, is lower risk and doesn't have what we deem as the highest risk, which are alkylating agents. And so, um, so that all can look great and someone can enter treatment and feel they don't need to do preservation. However, depending on how the person responds to the treatment and whether they, you know, go into a remission or, or maybe later they would relapse. What happens is, you know, someone may lose that window of time before they've started treatment to bank. And so I think that patients and, you know, their healthcare team, their oncology team has to think about that. What is the likelihood that this person might not ever come off treatment and that they might actually have to escalate their treatment, you know, so even though we feel they're low risk for infertility now, what is the chance and how do I lay that out to them? Another kind of factor that makes this, I think a little bit difficult is, and you probably, you know, are well aware of this from the world of infertility is that I don't, I don't think that we have a great grip on fertility. (laughs) So you've got patients and we've talked to patients who have gone in with the understanding that the treatment they're going to have is fairly low risk and they come out and they're infertile. Part of that may be, you know what, perhaps you were subfertile before, or there are these other factors that you weren't aware of. So usually there's, there's not a lot of pre-treatment fertility testing or anything like that. And it's not that precise and, and vice versa. There are people who have very high levels of treatment who you could almost say would certainly be, you know, rendered sterile from their treatment. And they are of that belief and they're moving forward in, in their life. And then they get pregnant. It's really hard because it's not binary, you know, so you have so many eggs or so, you know, so much sperm and you really just need that one to get, to get through. So I think it's, it's just a very imprecise place that we're in. And it's frustrating because I think I always go to talks and I hear people talk about coming up with calculators and we've tried to do it and, you know, and you can look at different drugs, but the drugs change, people get uh, combinations of drugs, people get drugs and radiation. So radiation itself is very damaging. You know, you're going to have pelvic radiation, you know, that is a problem. Often you're just not certain of where you are when you go in and then what the effect is going to be and how your own body is going to react to that. So I think if people really deeply, deeply want to have their own, you know, genetically related or, or biological children, then they need to think about banking, you know, just in case. 
it's so important because even like, let's say people did pre-cancer treatment blood work, you know, there's still debates on what the blood work means because totally. it's still down to the egg quality. So none yeah. of this is black and white. It, it really is like a risk benefit and then the dollars that you have and all of yeah. those things. But I think in the beginning, people just need that, that reality check. You know, there are blood tests, there are at-home tests that are directionally giving you information, but again, no guarantees. So when it comes to the process, talk about what fertility preservation means and how it works. I also would like for you to touch on, because I've heard anecdotally, there are stories where someone is diagnosed and it's like, no, you need to go to surgery tomorrow. And then it's, oh my God, what do we do? So hopefully that's a minimum number of cases, but can you just walk us through in an ideal world, you're at the center, they've got the fertility piece down, they know how to talk to you, they educate you, like what would that ideal scenario look like? So I think the ideal scenario would be that you get the diagnosis and in part of your very early conversations, I'm not saying it has to be simultaneous with that because it's overwhelming and it's like drinking, you know, from the fire hose with all the information coming at you, but very early in that process, when you are understanding or being informed of, um, what the treatment plan ideally will be right. So unless you're doing something that's really, really low risk, like if you had maybe stage one, you know, in situ melanoma, and you're just going to have something removed and no further treatment or something, most people need to have, you know, this discussion that you're having this kind of chemotherapy, or we're planning to do a bone marrow transplant, or this is what this looks like. And this is the level of risk. And then would you like a referral to see a reproductive endocrinologist, a fertility specialist, so that you can understand, you know, the process and, and what this would entail and, and whether you're a candidate. And so, um, I mean, there are a rare few cancer centers across the country that have that capability in house to kind of do the counseling. Otherwise I would say the patient would be offered a referral over to a reproductive specialist. The earliest meeting with a reproductive specialist is key, right? Because all of these steps in a, in a, IVF cycle, right? And I'll just call it that. I mean, you're not really going through and doing IVF at this stage, but in that hyperstimulation cycle, right? To, to get to the place where you can collect eggs, you know, it's going to take probably at a minimum 10 days to 14 days to administer all the medications and all of that. So yes, it needs to be a very early intervention where this choice is laid out. And I would say also, even for patients who have to immediately start treatment, which is rare. Um, but there are definitely patients, I would say, particularly with sometimes present to the oncologist and they're already very sick, right? So there are people who have, you know, certain blood cancers, leukemia who present and they need to start treatment maybe the next day, right? That's, that's the most likely scenario for that. And those patients are probably going to be too medically unstable, too sick, you know, to go through this process and they can't delay. So, but that's rare that someone really, really, you know, can't delay. So the other part of it, it, I will say is there are some studies. There was a study, I believe out of UCSF, the doctors there looked at, uh, I think it was breast cancer patients in particular, um, who needed to do uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So chemotherapy before they would have surgery even, and they compared those who did fertility preservation to those who did not. And the start time to treatment was just a matter of days different. So it really, when someone is diagnosed, there's a lot that you're thinking about, right? A lot of people want to get a second opinion. You have a lot of arrangements that you have to get into place. So most likely, you know, you can put this into that mix and not cause a delay. And I think Historically, I, my my knee jerk response to the idea of fertility preservation causing delay and somehow harming the patient, I, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know that that has been shown or proven. For me personally, I was diagnosed. I had surgery 
And then I saw a fertility specialist. And so I was supposed to start chemotherapy at, at, um, five weeks after my surgery. And in going to the fertility specialist, it was clear this, this process was going to take six weeks. Right. And then I could start. And there was some tussling back and forth, you know, between the reproductive doctors and the, and, and the oncology team. And as a patient, yes, then I had to say, I want to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the reaper, you know, with the fertility preservation cycle. And I, and it's important enough. And can you really explain to me what the difference is between five weeks versus six weeks to start? And no one really could. So I don't, I don't think that there's data that shows that doing this intervention causes any kind of harm or, or worse effect for a cancer patient. Now, obviously someone can't do cycle after cycle or put off treatment, let's say for months and months. I think that could become harmful, obviously. Male fertility versus female fertility. So you said 20 years ago, no one asked you, and it seems like you somehow figured it out because you proactively were able to get this managed for your own life. Lance Armstrong, that was around the same time, I'm guessing, I don't know, I can't remember now how long, but I would say within a few years Yeah, and he mm-hmm. preserved his fertility and went on mm-hmm. to have children. And, and by the way, when I interviewed um, Kristen Rojas about sexual health, she said mm-hmm. the, one of the first things like when men have prostate cancer, talk about the sexual health, make sure that it's taken care of, but for women, it's not brought up. So are we seeing the same thing when it comes to fertility? <laughs> You're smiling. Oh no, yeah, did I, I stir mean, the pot? <laughs> No, you know, I have, I have my own strong feelings about this. I would say, well, when you're talking about prostate cancer, or I think a lot of early work and interventions and programs were built around sperm banking. And a lot of that was for testicular cancer patients. So Uh, like Lance Armstrong was a testicular cancer patient. So I do, to be fair, I do think that the, you know, sexual and even reproductive implications of those cancers are clear and kind of inherent in what you're doing, right? So, you know, I think obviously if someone had, let's say cervical cancer or something, there might be more of a discussion, like you're not going to be able to carry a pregnancy after this, or, you know, those kinds of things. I think where people really got left out was, you know, having, strange other cancers or a lymphoma or something like that, because a patient, a lay person, you know, would not naturally conclude that this would impact their reproductive health. Right. So I think that's where a lot of people fell through for a long time. Okay. You know, some of the earliest work, um, in setting up programs, um, you know, or like I know Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, CHOP, they were early on this idea that anyone, um, you know, diagnosed a young man needs to be offered sperm banking. Um, there was a pioneer, Dr. Leslie Shover at MD Anderson. And so she also really was on the forefront of looking at this need and it was all around sperm banking at that time. And you know, the, the reproductive world So at that time, like 20 years ago, egg freezing really, it it really didn't exist. So for a woman, your opportunity to do fertility preservation was really only um, extended to you through embryo freezing. So that was a much less, I think, you know, attractive option. So you can imagine if you're 18 years old and you're diagnosed and you're single. I mean, we really anecdotally, I mean, we would hear these stories. People were offered, you know, like a donor sperm book, like, so you're dealing with cancer. You're really, you know, you, maybe you're dropping out of college. Like there's so much going on. And then you have to decide, like, do I ever want to have children? Will I carry children? Do I want to be a parent? How will I go about it? Should I pick this, this person (laughs) as my sperm donor. So it was a lot and random start stimulation didn't exist. So you were really only able to offer this to on the female side to, to women or girls who had 
and I should say post-pubertal girls um, who had, you know, six weeks at least, right. To be, to be taking this on. So it was, it was pretty limited. And so, uh, you know, and I'm not making excuses for people not fully vetting this or talking to their patients about it sufficiently, but there, there weren't really good options okay. at that time. Makes a lot of sense. Now, that mm-hmm. context is extremely helpful. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. Hmm. So what happens if you're a little girl? Okay. So I want to touch on two points of that. So the reality there is that that you, first of all, your options are very limited, right? And, um, but now ovarian uh, tissue cryopreservation, which is a technique where you remove either one ovary or part of an ovary and then process it and freeze it, that does exist. And ASRM recognized that in 2000, I think 19 or the end of 18, they came out with kind of the position that that was no longer experimental as a technique. Well, there's some debate about whether that's experimental for pre-pubertal girls. I mean, all the data on the efficacy of that technique that informed that opinion to make it non-experimental, that all came based on using it in, in women who were older. Right. So, but people saw that it, it was viable, it was workable and it could be done. So for pre-pubertal girls, that's, that's their only option, right? Um, For pre-pubertal boys at this stage of the game, there is a parallel in testicular tissue freezing, but that is still considered experimental. So that is, has not been accepted at the same level yet. And there just isn't sufficient data to support that yet, but it is going on and it is a chance that people would have. The second part of that equation for pre-pubertal girls, I would say, um, what I'm conveying to you has been, you know, shared with me through pediatric oncologists who are on our board of directors and on our medical advisory team, they really always try to emphasize that because you're born with all the eggs that you're going to have, right. And you have this, this pool, this, this reserve of eggs that typically the younger you are as a woman, the better off you're going to be when you come out of treatment. Now that having been said, there may have been a lot of damage done from your treatment. You may then enter menopause early or extremely early. So that is something that I think patients and their families need to be really aware of and that people shouldn't rest back on the idea that, you know, they, as a pediatric survivor now have returned to menstruation. And so therefore everything's a okay. Their reserve may have been cut by 10 or 15 years, right? So you need to really be aware of that and do maybe post-treatment fertility testing and monitoring and understand that your window of opportunity may really be decreased. And there is this push, I think, um, from the pediatric world that for those patients who couldn't preserve, right, because they were too young or they were too sick, that you may have an opportunity post-treatment to do fertility preservation. So it sounds like a little bit like the wrong language, but you're, you're doing preservation, but before you would go into like an early menopause that was really caused by your treatment. Yep. Um, that makes sense. So yeah, that's okay. kind of an emerging, I think, approach, because okay. I think even for some 
females who biologically or physiologically may be able to do egg freezing. I mean, it may be a lot to ask and it okay. can be, you know, it's invasive and, and it could be. So I think psychologically there may be some barriers there too. And it may make more sense if someone's at a low to mid level risk of infertility to get through their treatment. And I know that runs counter to a little bit what I said before, but yes, the younger you are typically the more reserve you're starting out with. Yep. So you're going to come out and maybe have a window to do post-treatment. So one thing I just wanted to do very simply is break down fertility preservation. So it's a certain amount of days. A lot of people say it's 14, but it's not for everybody. After your cycle starts, you ovulate an egg. People that have twins, triplets, more than one egg. What the drugs do in that time frame is grow, again, overly simplifying, more eggs that could ovulate and they take those out and then preserve them. But if you have a partner or donated sperm you want to use, then it's frozen as an embryo, which my understanding is the rates of success after, and again, the data may have changed since I last looked at it, are higher with an embryo than with just an egg. So that's another consideration that people have to take into account. You know, the IVF part is when you're ready to take in the embryo at the right time of the month that gets put back in. But in this case, you're freezing it for when you're ready to use it as a, at a later date. Would that be a fairly good overly simplification to just give people a general idea? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I try to sometimes explain it to people like, it's just like if you were going through IVF, but you're basically doing the front end of Correct. it. Yep. So you're doing all the same steps, which as you described, you're taking medications shots um, to mature a lot of eggs at once. And the doctors will monitor that, right? And do blood work and ultrasounds, make sure things are going well and, and that things are, are proceeding in a safe manner, yep. right? So you don't get hyper-stimulated. And then yes, take out the eggs. For cancer patients, this technique of doing random start stimulation means that that whole process can be accelerated, not, not made shorter, but started more quickly than it would in a standard patient. I think another important thing for cancer patients specifically to know is that different protocols have also been developed that would keep estrogen levels down. So different drugs can be used. There's a drug called letrozole and that can be used for stimulation. And so that is at once stimulating your eggs to mature a lot of eggs. You can get out as many as you can to bank them. Um, but at the same time, keeping your estrogen levels under control. So if you have a hormonal, hormonally sensitive cancer, like a breast cancer or something that's driven by hormones, you should know that techniques have been developed just for you. And, and people have really looked at this and thought about it and wanted to keep those hormone levels low for you. I just also want patients to know that, as you said, there's no guarantee, right? So if you go through and you preserve and what you're doing is you're creating, you know, a better option and, and maybe increasing your odds that you'll be able to have genetically related children. Um, but I think there's a lot of regret on the part of patients who didn't get to do this. And I think patients should know that it isn't black and white and you may retain fertility. You may retain fertility for a certain period of time. And you should know there are such great third party family building options now that there are a lot of choices that people didn't have. And you may be able and healthy enough to carry a pregnancy. You may need donor sperm or donor eggs. You may want donor embryos. Um, I think for some patients also, they either have banked material or they don't, but then they can work with a surrogate. And, you know, all these options are expensive, but I think people should know that there are so many ways for them to build their family. There's adoption. I mean, there are many choices that will still remain for you. So people shouldn't feel like a heavy level of regret that I think the cancer world has changed and adapted and they know this is important to you and people are, are standing ready to kind of help you access all these different choices. So tell us what we need to know, because there are medical professionals who listen to the podcast and patients. 
And so from either one of those perspectives, I'm sure you have so many resources and places to direct people to, and I'll put any relevant links in my show notes for easy access, but maybe if you wanted to just verbalize the summary of, of what people need to know about what you can offer. First and foremost, we are a nonprofit organization and we're here to provide information and resources to patients. Um, we do not provide direct financial support, but we can link you to programs that do provide support for fertility preservation, financial support, and also for post-treatment family building options. Um, one of the main resources that we have on our website is called Fertility Scout, and that is essentially a clinic and service locator. So it will geolocate you and you can look for professionals who provide these services quickly. And some of that is even for the most specialized services like um, ovarian tissue or testicular tissue or things that you're not going to find really listed elsewhere, and also for post-treatment services. And to reproductive professionals who are listening and reproductive attorneys and surrogacy agencies, we want you all to list and be there so that patients can find you. So we really go out and provide that link between um, the cancer world and the reproductive world. So we'll, you know, be attending uh, cancer conferences and in contact all the time with young adult cancer programs. And so we want to have this resource built out to the extent possible. So all those services are are easily found and in one place. The other thing that we've really been involved in over the past few years is in partnership with Resolve and ASRM primarily, but also local cancer groups, depending on the state or whatever, is working to try to get insurance coverage for these services. And so I think one of the things that people don't understand is just how costly this is, how rarely insurance covers it. And so we found that to be that main barrier. And even the discussion that we started with about whether doctors are doing a great job, you know, informing their patients about this, there's something that, that we encounter. And one of the doctors we work with deemed the wallet biopsy. And that is, you know, well-meaning physicians trying to insulate their patients from further harm by not really getting into the nitty gritty of this or making space for this discussion because they know their patient can't afford it. And so what we would like to do and see is that this medically indicated preservation um, be covered by insurance so that patients can get it. And we think even having that uh, coverage is a sign to physicians that this is something that is medically indicated, medically necessary, and you should feel free to talk about it and your patients will be able to access. That's amazing. So last question, what is a fun fact that we should know about you? I don't know. I, I guess pertinent to this issue or related, I would say a fun fact about me is that I am a fraternal twin and I have fraternal twin daughters as well. No way. Yeah. So I oh, think that is a fun a fact. Thank you for all the work that you're, you're doing. It is, it is so needed. And uh, thank you so much for making time. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the Fem Power Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about Vempower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support Fempower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by Fempower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the Fempower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week.
Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.